Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Suzanne Foxton. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you, Rick. Um, first of all, somebody who's a fan of yours or something got in touch with me, and then you got in touch with me, and so we did this interview, and your fan said, whoever she was, I don't remember, that um, there's something more juicy in the book you wrote that um, than has been coming out in interviews, so so maybe we'll get to that. But, but <laughs> <let's> <laughs> I think that the, the book is definitely juicier than anything has actually seemed to happen to me. Okay. So. <laughs> but... Um, for, and, uh, with apologies to uh, to listeners and viewers, it, or viewers in particular, um, Suzanne's video tends to freeze up from time to time, dur and hopefully it won't stay frozen. Um, but if you see a still shot of her for a while, we'll just continue on because we can't continually stop the interview just because the video freezes. Um, so you grew up in Indiana, as I understand. I did. And um, you now live in the UK. So so you. I, you married a Brit for some reason. Um, uh, who knows why, but yes, I did. <laughs> How, how'd you meet him? Uh, we met in San Francisco, uh, completely by mistake. I was uh, selling earrings at the time. I, I still do, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing some now, my earrings and my thing. And uh, I saw a bartenderess in a wine bar who, it's the 80s, mind you, big earrings she had on. And I thought, oh, I can sell her earrings. And he wandered in looking for the uh, theater next door to buy tickets and we stopped and had a drink together and he was late for his date and uh, he um, that, that was it and mm -hmm. we've been together ever since and that was in 1988 oh cool that's around the time I got married 87 <laughs> um, turn your video off and on briefly and we'll just keep talking while you do that um, so and you have what two kids I do I do they're 14 and 16 okay and uh, you, so you, you make earrings, and you, I'm asking you some rather trivial, superficial questions, but it just gives people a sense, you know. Of what oh, I love the trivial and superficial. It's <laughs> okay. just extremely meaningful, and, and uh, I really like talking about it, actually. Good. What does your husband do for a living? Uh, he is an account manager for a software firm, okay. which is, you know, seems really, really dull, but uh, he's very good at it. He enjoys it. Huh. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> I forget who said it, but someone said, it might have been Steve Jobs or George Lucas or somebody who said, if you love what you're doing, you don't work a day in your life. Yeah, that's true. I think that he, he does the feel he works a day in his life, but he still, he's quite good at it. Yeah. Let me just tell my wife something here. Um, I didn't feed the birds because we've, we've run out of bird seeds. She said the birds are pecking at the window asking for seeds, but we're totally <laughs> out of seeds, I'm afraid. We have to get some. You see, you've made them dependent upon you. <laughs> I know. A bunch of little <laughs> avian junkies out here. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of junkies, I guess you had a bit of a, uh, a colorful history with drugs and stuff, right? You talk about that in, uh, in your... Yeah, yeah. I d and I think that... Um, Addiction and addictive sort of uh, tendencies or activities is just another kind of seeking. Mm. You know, I always say I was never a traditional seeker, but you know, in a way, everything that one seems to do, every uh, activity the ego s engages in, is some kind of seeking. And uh, I suppose um, addiction is just sort of uh, a very strong example of, of seeking, of, of not being okay with however things are. They either have to be better or they have to be less painful or even if they're fantastic, they have to be even better. Uh, they just have to be different. There's no sort of this, uh, I don't know, like mindfulness speak of, you know, being in the moment and, you know, just being completely accepting of everything that's going on. Mm. And I don't think that's really, you know, what non-duality is about. I don't think non-duality is necessarily about any one particular thing. But those kind of concepts and pointers seem to come up a lot, that people are just not content and they are forever seeking. And I think it's just, you know, probably part of the human condition. But, you know, with something like addiction, uh, it can get very destructive. Yeah. Well, yeah, when you think about it, the whole human race has been pretty much obsessed with changing their state of consciousness throughout recorded history, you know, through every possible means that, that they can find. Yes, it's true. And the... That's part of it, I'm sure, and it's part of uh, the behavior of many seekers is to uh, to try to achieve some state of bliss, you know, to mm -hmm. feel really, really good. Not just kind of good, but totally good, you know. Yeah. So good that you are everything, and you're out of the end, and everything is completely wonderful, and, and I think that that's great, and sometimes that comes up 
uh, and sometimes it comes up from taking some kind of substance, but sometimes it can come up, you know, out of the blue, or it can come up from a meditative state or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, if that's the only thing you want, if that's the only thing your ego craves, then you're sort of missing out on deeply fulfilling negative states. Hmm. So, I mean, and it, it's all just pointers and concepts, but uh, I've come to, uh, you know, to the set of concepts that say that uh, life is everything. It's set up exactly the way it's meant to be, and you're meant to have some, you know, not very nice feelings and, and things happen, and and that is just the way that it is, and, and but that's not a bad thing. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, turn your video off and on again while I ask this next question. Um, it's interesting, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, in a way you can't blame people for wanting to change the way they see the world because it can be fairly um, unfulfilling, as you were just saying. And so there's a kind of a natural craving for it to improve upon it. On the other hand, in, in non-dual and, and spiritual teachings, there's always this admonition to just, uh, this is it, you know, I mean, what you see is what you get, just kind of like uh, love what is and so on. Uh, so there's kind of a paradox there, and, and a lot of people might find that advice a little bit hard to swallow because they find what is to be quite unlovable. You mm. know? Well, I suppose that uh, the, the whole thing about making oneself feel better and needing to have whatever it is be lovable, maybe that's a bit of, uh, you know, more mistaken than most concepts. Uh, it's not, you know, necessarily li liking or loving uh, bad, you know, apparent bad circumstances and bad feelings. It's more like um, relishing them and uh, just uh, seeing them as a neutral thing and not necessarily a bad thing. But I do remember, you know, when I was just uh, about three years ago, all these things were sort of apparently gelling. And uh, I was sitting in the back of my house, sort of at our, our picnic table. It's a very still day. It's kind of gray and cloudy, like it often is here in the UK. And I and I'm like, this is enough, is it? This is enough. This is really, really boring. I just I can't see how this is enough. But it was a momentary thing, mm -hmm. and it was enough. It was enough, you know. Uh, the next apparent instant, uh, I was, you know, just walking and going across my yard and going back into the house and uh, thought of a robin and yada yada, nature, nature, and oh, you know, fascination. And so it just, you know, in the apparent unfolding story that seems to happen in time, if you seem to be stuck in that, you wait long enough, it'll change. You know, you wait, if it's horrible, you wait long enough, it'll change into something that's uh, not horrible anymore. It's true. I mean, and turn your video on and off. Um, and like, but it, there is sort of a natural human tendency, is there not, to um, want to improve things, to want to make things better? Like this morning, for instance, I woke up with a slight headache, and I still have it. And I'd rather not have the headache, but I can live with it, you know. However, a, a friend of mine recently broke his back, and he's in like excruciating agony. Uh, and you know, for most, you know, he says like you know, fist clenching, white knuckle, teeth gritting, pain most of the day. And uh, obviously, I mean, if we had our druthers, we would choose not to be going through a thing like that. So, how do you kind of reconcile that with the notion of you know, just accepting everything as it is? Well, uh, I don't know that. Uh I'm not really sort of advocating this sort of conscious, willful, grasping acceptance, I'm going to accept this kind of thing. Uh, it, it's more of an organic thing, I suppose, what I'm talking about. But hey, you know, um, there's abs absolutely nothing wrong with wanting something to be better, wanting pain to go away. Uh, you know, the way that we seem to be manifesting, uh, you want, it, it's all a dream, sure, but you know the way the dream seems to be coming out is that we are these biological creatures that need to survive, and you know pain is is you know part of the whole survival packet of tools. And if you feel pain, something's wrong. And if you can get rid of the pain, then it's better again, and you have more chance of surviving. Uh, so you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with with that. Uh, and, and I don't think that it's necessarily preferable to sit back and just uh, totally accept everything and and uh, for instance one of the times I get into 
conflicts with my husband about all these sets of concepts is that he's very ambitious and he wants, he's always very much into improvement and a lot of the things talk about it does very much sound like you're just going to sit back and be a couch potato you know and do nothing and it's not that necessarily at all uh, it's much more being open to everything and then all sorts of possibilities can happen and open up and potentialities can <clears throat> appear to unfold in the story of life that maybe if you are a little if you have too much of a, a set and narrow goal you won't see these opportunities and these doors and, and windows and potentialities uh, so I think it's more of a maybe more of an openness rather than sort of a willful no matter what happens I'm gonna accept it in a job like fashion I know that's mm. probably not exactly what I'm talking about yeah I tell you what as a <clears throat> as a um, standard practice during this interview every time I ask a question turn your video on and off unless, <laughs> okay. I, unless I tell you not to do so because <laughs> okay. it, it keeps freezing up but it's good for a little bit um, so uh, yeah just keep that as a reminder every time I ask a question go ahead okay. and do it. <laughs> sure, sure. I just did it hopefully it's alright no, now. No it's working again now. Okay. Um, so this brings up an interesting point which um, I've thought about a lot uh, over the years and which you know has I've kind of worked out in my own experience over the years and and that is that there's this there can be this sort of paradoxical simultaneous complete acceptance and non-insistence that things happen in any particular way with simultaneously uh, a sort of a you know driving ambition if that's how you're wired and the two are not um, counter proposed you agree with that yeah I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive at all Right. Whatever it seems to be happening is what seems to be happening. If you seem to be wired up a certain way, that's the way you seem to be wired up. You could go to a lot of trouble, try to recondition yourself, blah, blah, blah. That's okay, too. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, as I've said, you know, before, I, just in this interview and many others, I just don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with anything. I mean, in the character Suzanne, there are quite a few things that are wrong for, for me to do. But in the whole big sort of picture of everything manifesting, I don't think there's anything wrong, including people who are very greedy even. You know, people are very, you know, driven. Um, I mean, I would like to see more people driven to succeed at certain tasks for their own sake rather than to make sure they get more and more money and more than other people and keeping it from other people, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That would be a preference that arises. But no, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, I think that often people who are on this kind of a spiritual path or whatever it is, it, it, it happens for them in many different ways. And oftentimes they go from being a, re a very repressed, timid, um, non-confrontational person to being quite the risk taker. And often that goes hand in hand with accomplishing all sorts of goals and tasks. And it's not, you know, people who are Buddhists who are very intense and, and and intent upon um, completing their training are extremely driven are they're very very motivated and incredibly ambitious you know yeah. <laughs> even if the ambition has to do with you know where that ambition is coming from how you conceptualize the ambition whether the ego is the thing that it happens to or not and that kind of thing mm. but you know I don't know I don't think that those you know being completely accepting and being quite driven I don't think that they're mutually exclusive at all Good. I want to come back to this because there's some interesting things that I've uh, considered when listening to your audio recordings that I want to talk to you about. But let's go back a bit more and, and kind of talk about your own sort of uh, watershed moment. Um, you you were, you know, I, I haven't heard too much detail about your whole drug and addiction phase. And I don't know if we need to go into that. But then you, in, in, your, in telling your story, you kind of skip to this point where you're standing in a kitchen and you look at a knife and, certain, and then suddenly the whole, <laughs> <laughs> the whole, your whole world changes. Um, so fill us in a little bit on, on you know, maybe the prior to that um, watershed moment and, uh, and uh, leading up to it and then the, you know, that moment itself. Um, well, you know, the best way to describe that is, first of all, put a big caveat in front of it saying it, it wasn't really very important mm -hmm. and the reason it wasn't really very important is that uh, in the way stories seem to unfold many different things happen in many different ways and I think for many people it's a very gradual kind of awakening if you want to use that mm -hmm. kind of term 
And I wouldn't say that I was awake, uh, awakened or an awakened person or enlightened or whatever the label is we're using today on a, what is it, Saturday afternoon <laughs> my time. Whatever the thing it's okay to say is right now. Uh, but I would say that um, the reason it was such a big deal, and I did have a little sort of a phenomenology around it, whereas a bit like tripping, I suppose, where the knife just seemed, you know, like, whoa, man, what is a knife? It's such a knife, you know. But that was very brief and, and unimportant. The, me the reason it was such a big deal is I realized that I had had the right state of mind the whole time. That I, I, I'd been in, 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 in enlightenment, awakening, or I wasn't using that terminology at the time. What I realized is that what I had been looking for was this life exactly as it is. Hmm. Not any different. I didn't need to, to make it any different. I didn't need to make it anything at all. And that is sort of the, the ego death part, I suppose. So that, and that includes all your darker addictive phases, you, you're saying? Oh. That well, yeah, there was no uh, need that those are perfect as they were. Absolutely, um, okay. you know, people, uh, particular teachers and, and and persons who are seekers and all all kinds of people actually are are very keen on relieving suffering. Mm -hmm. They're very very much um, that is their uh, big deal. That is what they want to do. That is their big goal. That they're very driven to achieve is to relieve suffering. And, uh, however, without all the suffering that apparently came up in my life, which is only just a little memory, spark of something or other that's happening right now, um, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's not real, but uh, all that suffering, uh, I wouldn't have had anything to compare this to. Uh, it, life is everything. And um, suffering came up, I, I wouldn't trade it. I, if I could go back and, and, you know, if I had, you know, that, that imaginative opportunity that many writers use to relive your life, how would you rewrite your life? I wouldn't rewrite it I, I, at all. Um, and there's probably a couple of specific incidents where I was very unkind to other people that I would probably wish went differently. But as a generally, I wouldn't rewrite it because um, that suffering was, was as it should be. And, and you know, if you sort of just look at the story of my life, you know, quite in a detached way, I mean, it makes a great deal of sense that that happened that way, and then it makes a great deal of sense that now it would be in a, you know, apparently much better place and much happier and content and, and blah, 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 although that isn't always the case either. Well, if you do manage to go back, I would suggest that you play the stock market with today's <laughs> information. That would be Yes, cool. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Send me a cut. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's the Back to the Future 2, isn't don't, it? Yeah. Don't forget to turn your video back on again after you turn it oh, off. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, so, uh, but then again, I mean, if one of your kids has the flu and is feeling horrible, you don't just think to yourself, oh, this is going to be good for them because they'll feel so good when it's over. You do whatever you can to ameliorate <laughs> it, you know? That's right. That's true. Yeah. Though I do make them work quite hard sometimes, knowing that when that's over, they will feel much better afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, finish fold <laughs> they finish folding this astronomically high pile of clothes or whatever, or when they finish <laughs> hoovering the entire house or whatever ridiculous task I've set for them. Yeah. One thing that came to my mind, so I think you haven't talked about this knife incident enough, because I'm familiar with it, because I listen to your videos a lot, but um, other people might not know what exactly you're talking about. But what you were saying was that, um, you know, you out of the blue, without really having much background as a spiritual seeker or anything, you had this kind of uh, awakening or shift. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that that's what it was at the time. Um, I just thought that I'd finally come to my senses. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a, the, what language I would have put it. Uh, right afterwards, uh, I was walking around the kitchen going, oh, this is just so obvious. It's so obvious. It's so obvious. And what was obvious was that my life is what I had been looking for. There was nothing I had, had to change. And, um, but because I had, you know, I had some phenomenology that, that went around it and some sort of physical weirdness that, that went around it and I was just thinking why well, am I having flashbacks to things I may have done at university I don't know um, <laughs> you know things I felt like I was coming up out of the top of my head from time to time I felt like I was seeing things from over here maybe like my eyes were over here or um, and that would generally happen I was quite tired as well so 
Um, it's probably just because uh, I, I don't know why it was. It doesn't really matter. Um, but you know that because of that, I, I needed to my 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 mind, my my brain, my little scared bit of my ego needed to have some labels to put on it. So I did a little looking around. Uh, I went to see Tony Parsons because he's quite nearby. As it seemed, and and so I got some labels, and so that's that's how what I labeled it afterwards. Hmm. Well, probably the labels were appropriate. I mean, it was some sort of spiritual awakening or shift, or you know, whatever terminology you're you're good with, mm -hmm. uh, seems to have been what it was. I mean, judging mm -hmm. from what you the way you've been talking and writing ever since then, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, and those do happen to people quite spontaneously, often without, oh, not often, but sometimes without any kind of. A proclivity toward that sort of thing, you know. I previ think previously, it, it yeah. seems to be the the case. Um, and I know there are many people who are very traditional and they uh, very much into practice and peeling away the the layers of the ego um, through meditation and through you know maybe devotion to a guru or teaching certain teachings and um, feel that that's the only way to achieve this kind of uh, state of mind or whatever it is, a lack of state of mind or whatever it is, who knows. Um, but I think that, you know, practice is often just life as it is presented. Uh, everybody has their own practice and it is just the way their life unfolds for them. That is their practice. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I'm very traditional in the sense that I've been meditating for decades, but I wouldn't say it's the, I'm not fundamentalist about it. I wouldn't say it's the only way. Obviously, there are people who have what you had, you know, and many such stories. You know, I, I, I've interviewed several people like that who just out of the blue just kind of woke up and uh, didn't, uh, and, and often thought they were going crazy at first until they could somehow get a little bit of, you know, intellectual re, uh, reinforcement or, you know, just you know, wh wh whatever word I'm searching for, explanation for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah, I needed a couple of labels, something to call it, uh, because I just felt as if I was, uh, you know, it just felt a bit strange. I suspect that there are people in mental hospitals who have had genuine spiritual awakenings, and they and their people and the people around them thought they were going crazy and locked them up. Well, it's very possible. Put them on Thorazine or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, the, it's very possible. Certainly, the, the weirdness, though, for me, has seemed to uh, uh, subside, mm -hmm. and I, I feel quite at home and. And uh, I know lots of different teachers say this, but it's just very ordinary, and people just don't believe it. Um, enlightenment, waking, whatever, it is ordinary life. It's just a mundane, ordinary, the dream, the thing that we're calling the illusion of life, the dream, that's, that's what it is. That, that's it. Um, the people, and, and it's just ex your life, your perceptions, your judgments, your labeling, your thoughts, your not being able to meditate, your over meditate, whatever it is, that's, it, that's what it is. Um, and, and it's, people don't believe it. They just, they don't believe it. They think they got to work real hard, they got to be different, or there's something wrong with them, they feel unworthy, um, and they, they're not, you know, mm. they don't. It, it, oneness does not get any oneer. <laughs> you know, uh, while you're meditating, and it doesn't, you know, everything doesn't become a little better at being everything because you and your little ego have managed to peel away another layer or whatever. Maybe the whole issue of wanting it or expecting it to be flashy um, it kind of relates back to what we were saying in the beginning about, um, you know, not being satisfied with your experience as it is and wanting to change it in some way and so there's this sort of wishful anticipation that it could be such it could be so, life could be so much more gloriously profound and <laughs> amazing than it is than my than me me having to get up in the morning and going to work and you know blah and dealing with the boss and whatnot people kind of are looking for some you know, walking on water, angels singing kind of experience. Well, that kind of stuff can come up too. Um, yeah. But yeah, that getting up and having breakfast with the husband and, and that's amazing. You know, it is, it, it really is. And, but it's difficult if it's you're sort of in a humdrum routine. It's just difficult to uh, to say it to see it that you know all every moment is created new. Every moment is completely new, and it's never exactly the same. It, it, everything is just what we you know sort of our senses bring us as reality, it's just, uh, it is in constant total flux 
an endless moment that is never ever the same and the, the foot's never in the, the same place and you never put your foot down the same two different you never have the same Rex with your husband it's all completely totally brand new reborn in every apparent new second and that's what's amazing mm -hmm. um, and it, it, you don't have to have some sort of shift of perception to, to see that I really don't think it, it just you know the people have the right state of mind and perception already that, that they don't believe it Although there is such a thing as conditioning, you know, I mean, the routine, humdrum, repetitive experiences of life can sort of, you know, don't forget to change your video, can sort of dull or, or you know, occlude one's perception. And uh, what you apparently experienced was, was a shift in which conditioning no longer had the same grip on you that it, it ordinarily has on people. In other words, it's sort of like, you know, there's a, in, in the Indian tradition, there's this analogy of, you know, if you make a mark on stone, it, it really etches in there and stays. If you make a mark on sand, it, you, you see the mark, but it goes away. If you make a mark on water, it goes away really easily. If you make a mark on air, you don't even see the mark and it, it, nothing stays. So and that, that's used to illustrate different degrees of conditioning and susceptibility to conditioning that different people have. And the, and the enlightened person is supposed to be one who is like, you know, like the line on air. It's just uh, the experience is there, but nothing sticks. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, well, that's, that's a really good analogy. I should read more. But uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, your conditioning comes up. I still have conditioning, I suppose, but I don't care. <laughs> Yeah. It, 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 it would be, you know, the water, It doesn't, it air. doesn't bind you. No, it doesn't, you know, it, the outcome of it, I, I don't care. You know, I, I mean, I do. I mean, I want my children to stay healthy and well, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. Sure. All that stuff related to survival, that still comes up. Conditioning still comes up. But, you know, so what? Uh, it, it doesn't, I'm not invested in it so much, I suppose, anymore. I, I don't... My persona isn't the only thing I am anymore. It, it's whatever happens to that persona is. It's not a a big deal. Um, I can, you know, I, I would probably prefer us not to lose all our money and have to move and not being able for our children to school. Blah blah blah. But if that kind of thing happened, then I'm. I know that oftentimes these kind of things happen, and the unfolding story is that you grow and learn. Blah 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 blah. So. You know, whatever happens, I, I truly believe that I, being my small little, little self, little persona, will be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't really matter, and I think that's the difference. You know, that I'm not invested in the outcome of the story anymore. Yeah. Well, there's plenty mm -hmm. of references to that sort of thing in the traditional, you know, scriptures too. They talk about, you know, that you don't live for the fruits of action. You you just sort of you have control over the moment alone and never over the fruits of action. So you just act in such a way spontaneously that you're not attached to the outcome, and and that's set, you know considered to be a, a healthier way of functioning. Makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's something I thought a lot about a lot when I was listening to you, which has kind of been on my mind anyway recently. Um, and actually, you didn't need to change the video that time. All right, so okay. So we, had, we hadn't been I'll, I'll leave it alone long. for a while. You just tell me from now I'll on. I'll tell you. Ordinarily, you do every time I talk, but um, that was such a brief interlude that you didn't. Okay. Um, but in any case, um, it's, it's sort of like I was interviewing um, Gangaji's husband a couple of weeks ago. I guess I shouldn't identify him that way because he has his own identity, Eli Jackson Bear. And he, he quoted something that uh, his teacher, Papaji, had said, which is, uh, as I recall, don't land anywhere. And t we, were, we were discussing that in the context of not kind of locking yourself into any particular perspective as being the absolute truth or the absolutely right one uh, to the exclusion of all others. Um, and the reason I think of that is, uh, in listening to you is that you, you're pretty good, I think, at, at kind of shifting around between different perspectives. On the one hand, I've heard you articulate that, uh, that ultimately nothing is happening at all and never has. And then at, at another time you might say, um, everything's perfect just as it is. Uh, and then another time you might say, well, yeah, but I've got this situation with my kids or whatever that I need to deal with. <laughs> and and my, my attitude on all, all that is that um, no one of those can be kind of, you know, adhered to to the exclusion of the others. Paradoxically opposed as they may be, it's it's kind of the best approach is to take the whole big package and accept them all as as being valid each in their own realm. 
Yeah, I, I think that, um, well, mind does have a lot of trouble. The mind in general has trouble with um, uh, opposing concepts um, happening or appearing to happen simultaneously or in the same sphere. Um, and it wants to chop them and change them and categorize them and subcategorize them and, and make them, you know, uh, make sense. Have them all very neat and tidy and figured out. And of course, uh, that's impossible. And uh, yeah, I like the I like the, uh, the analogy. Don't land anywhere. I mean, I find my own writing about uh, non-duality or whatever, and uh, it, it changes and morphs all the time. Um, my mind kind of goes over here to there's nothing happening like it's like a big different concept but it it, it isn't you know even though there seems to be lots happening um, it makes perfect sense to me that there is you know there is really nothing happening and um, I, I see all this around and the eyes see and the here's here and all that but I also perceive somehow that it's it's not there at all that there's there's no space and, and really and there's it's like on the head of a pin or the, the point of a pin or smaller than that and mathematically uh, non-existent and uh, you know the big cosmos the same as, as the microcosm uh, the atom and blah 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 all that all those kind of analogies and I almost you know, my mind's put that over here and but you know it, it doesn't matter uh, uh, this whole thing about coming back to the marketplace having had some sort of awakening or whatever and then jumping back into life diving in and in really being able to enjoy the unfolding of the story is kind of where I'm at, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, there's those uh, Zen pictures of, you know, the ox herding pictures. I don't know if you've ever looked at those, but they depict the various stages of the path. And, and uh, you know, in the final one, the guy is back in the, in the marketplace riding the ox and, you know, completely integrated with the world. Whereas previously there was a picture where there was absolutely nothing there, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> various other stages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if there's been an unfolding, we might have all kind of been mished together and maybe out of order and, and out of sequence a little bit. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I just feel like um, I, I'm, th there is, seems to be less judgment about things, including my own attitude towards life or whatever. I don't feel like, oh, I must be this way or I must not be this way or I must only say this kind of thing or I must never say this or uh, whatever. Um, so with that kind of freedom, I've been able to just, you know, really, if there's a problem with the kids, I can kind of really jump in there and, and you know, analyze it and get in there what would be the best thing to do and, you know, really yeah. en enjoy trying to fix it and rather than saying, oh, my God, oh, this is all so wrong, it's all terrible, oh, what's going to happen, Ugh, you know. Yeah, and I mean, if one of your kids mm -hmm. runs in and says, Johnny's up in a tree and it looks like he's going to fall, you don't just say, oh, there is no tree, there is no Johnny. <laughs> 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 Depending on how, how mad I was at Johnny, actually. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> There's no tree. Johnny's not going to fall. You just go play over there. <laughs> um, I heard you allude to physics several times during some of your talks, and um, I find that to be a really helpful uh, metaphor or uh, structure of uh, understanding for, deal for coming to terms with what we're talking about right here. Which is that, you know, I mean, the physicist will tell you that life is structured in layers and that obviously on, on one layer we have, you know, paper and go deeper and it's carbon molecules and go deeper than that and it's atoms, which bear no resemblance to paper and keep going down and there's no atoms and, and you go down to a point where there's actually nothing of any substance whatsoever. And mm -hmm. that, you could say that's the ultimate reality, but um, the, the laws of that level don't, you know, um, pertain to the laws of this level you know you can't mm -hmm. light a fire on that level by you know striking a match so uh, but all these levels are like the Chinese the Russian dials contain one within the other and each has its own sort of uh, its own realm and its own significance and and the spiritual realm I think is very very similar to that where you're kind of you've inc incorporated a, a vast range of of creation within your experience including the rain the level at which nothing is happening including the level at which everything is perfect including the level at which damn it this needs to be changed <laughs> you know, <laughs> it all fit, it kind of fits into one big package yeah it, 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 I, I really truly believe that that's true that it does and you know but uh, I'm not going to hold on to that belief system necessarily either um, yeah and I did I, I find myself less and less concerned with 
see, there, there isn't anything there. I won't say that I'm egoless or whatever, but there isn't anything there that needs reassurance. You know, there isn't anything there that, that feels lost. Right. Uh, there isn't anything there that that needs to know that, you know, everything's going to be okay and, and things are a certain way and, and it, there just isn't anything there that needs that at all. Mm-hmm. Mother is at home. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Did your family notice much of a change in you? Uh, oh, well, gosh, yeah. I mean, I'm much more there and I'm, you know, much of I, you know, help them much more. I suppose I'm, I'm reliable now and... <laughs> The new and improved I, mom. Well, yeah, absolutely. And then I, I wrote a book, and it got published, and I'm actually earning a little bit of money, and you know, and I'm talking to people, and um, you know, I have coffee mornings once a month if you can touch with people. Because a friend of ours died recently, one of the moms in the neighborhood, and mm-hmm. and I wanted to make sure that everybody. This is one of the best things I do, frankly, is these coffee mornings. Just, you know, they're, because they're the primary school level moms and everybody's at secondary school now, what we call high school in America, uh, we just don't see each other very much and we just get in touch and, you know, so I'm doing that kind of thing. And, you know, but mind you, I mean, when I was sort of not very well and, you know, uh, definitely, you know, not only, ha- you know, having uh, addiction to substances, but, you know, doing things addictively. I was the chairperson of PTA. I was crazy busy, you know. I was, hmm. but you know, it was it was not uh, terribly present for it. I suppose I was just sort of running around like a crazy freak doing stuff. Yeah. And uh, so, um, you no, know, I'm just you know I'm much more involved, and you know, uh, I hear lots of talk flying around in the non-dual community if there is such thing about it's okay um, all this talk about enlightenment um, and being very spiritual but you know are you what are you doing about your relationships how intimate are you with with people how how risky are your relationships how willing you to be honest with other people and uh, how much you're willing to invest of the apparent time effort and energy that seems to come up into the people in your life and I think that that's that kind of hits the head, you know, the nail on the head for me just at the moment. Uh, I find that the biggest difference in my family is that I'm able to be very intimate with them and I'm able to um, not fear them in any possible way and, and uh, it, uh, uh, it makes life a very different kind of unfolding, uh, one that I definitely prefer but that, that I don't, I'm not saying that that's the way it, it, should, it should be or must be or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that um in the non-dual community, people are kind of coming to recognize that it's not enough to sort of have a non-dual sort of realization, but there needs to be an embodiment of it and an integration of it into practical life. Is that what you're alluding to? Yeah, integration, I think, is the word that I saw flying around recently, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's good because you don't need to change your video this time because you haven't okay. chosen yet. But I think that's good because um, there are a lot of people, not a lot, but some, well-known voices who who seem to insist that there is no practical ramification whatsoever of spiritual awakening. It's not. It has no bearing on your relative life. But what you've just described, and what many people describe, is that yeah, it's in, enhanced it a lot. It's made life a lot smoother, more you know, enriched it in various ways. Well, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't proscribe that there is. You know, integration must then be the next step if you've had some sort of awakening. Blah blah. Right. Blah. Right. And but you know, it just this seems to be the case to me. And on my sort of ego self, little self, whatever is, it resonates with that kind of you know reading and and those kind of concepts just right at the moment. And uh, yeah, I understand that. Um, I, I, you know, I, but I would go along with also, but there isn't really a practical application. Uh, there isn't anything that you're supposed to do next, but that just seems to be the, the case. I mean, and it seems to make, it seems to be, you know, a, a microcosm of of everything it, with your know, little personal relationships in a small circle. Um, if you are being as intimate, honest, blah 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 blah, with those people that are closest to you in your life. Uh, then that they are less other, um, and that you know you're, if you're getting as close to people as you can within the uh, 
the uh, limitations of the body and the mind and you know the separate apparent package and that's like a, a, a microcosm for the big oneness or whatever and so that's what seems to be happening well you know there's the old golden rule of um, do unto others as you would unto yourself and uh, some people say that's not really a, a prescription but a description actually mm -hmm. of you know if, if others are, are, are appreciated as the self <laughs> you know <laughs> then naturally there's going to be a, a much deeper intimate um, relationship with them and, um, c and compassion for them and so on. Yeah I mean it's chicken and egg it could be the way around I suppose um, one way is practice I am going to treat these people as and then the other one is that if the people really are seeming to be less other, then you just naturally do that. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Don't don't need to change your video this time. Um, it's uh, yeah. I like that. That it's it could both be chicken or egg. It it, it can be a, a laudable practice and could perhaps culture greater you know humanity or soft softness of heart or whatever. And it also can be descriptive of a spontaneous natural state that one can ha not help but act in accordance mm -hmm. with. Yeah, um, I mean, if you're going to, if the unfolding story seems to be about conditioning and, and training and, and practice, then that's a good one to do. Why not? Why not recondition your, your small self in that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, your, your video is still okay. I actually know it froze this time. So, um, <laughs> so you, you, apparently you write reams and reams <laughs> of stuff on your blog. and you know, oh, less, heard, less these days, but yeah, there's probably about 250,000 words on there, yeah. Yeah, I heard you say that, and it kind of discouraged me from trying to read any of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just pick and choose, pick and choose. It's all begin. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what do you write? What is it all? Um, oh, well, it's all, uh, I mean, these days I kind of have to be sparked off by something. I might see on Facebook or I don't mm -hmm. know, somebody says to me, and um, then I get a concept going. Or and, and I also have to have a film clip now, I've decided. And also a, to make a picture that I do myself. So it, it takes a while. It's about once a month I update it. Um, but I mean, it's just generally saying exactly what we're saying here over and over again with different pointers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, get, I go on to one that when I was first writing, I was like, oh, it all seems to be, it doesn't seem to make much sense, you know, the, the whole thing about uh, those mutually exclusive concepts where I just, I felt, you know, quite adrift, and, and then you can see the whole thing, you sort of chart the, the journey, or the apparent journey I've had through the, the blog and the pointers and whatnot, and uh, now it's more, much more about uh, um, picking on concepts that might be a little bit limiting, that seem to be a bit limiting, uh, because that, like we mentioned earlier, that you're questioning everything. Don't land anywhere. N never think you've got it. You think you got it, you haven't got it. You know, keep keep always question everything. You know, mm. every time you think that that you you this is it, then you it probably isn't. And just you know, so th that's kind of what the blog's about: is to to keep questioning and keep you know keep the whole thing rolling. That's nice. I like that. Uh, there's a well-known teacher who often says we should always have the attitude of a beginner, and says that even to you know people you would consider to be rather advanced. Um, and I think that's the implication that there's there's always fresh ground to break, and so you know don't rest on your laurels. <laughs> Keep questioning. Gosh, I, I would so agree with that. I mean, that just seems to be what what arises. What arises with me is uh, that sort of. Um Oh, there's pretty birds flying around up there. Oh, feed them for me. <laughs> the seagulls, they feed themselves. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, the, um, oh gosh, I was distracted by the birds. Well, you're okay. You're saying that's what's arising for me. I was saying about uh, always having the attitude of a beginner, and you, you kind of. Oh like yeah, that. yeah. Um, the more I know, the less I know. Uh, mm. Seriously, um, the the more, but you know, it's all sort of a big opening and and expanding in many ways but in many ways it's a, it's a bit of a narrowing and a contracting even though that's supposed to be an anathema to all this mm -hmm. uh, I mean being co I mean I, I spend quite a lot of time um, with a very set routine in my house with my writing and then my the housework and then I do the, go pick up the children and you know it's all quite da -da 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 -da. Um, I know that it's time in my life when that's uh, kind of the thing but you know it's quite a contracted life it's it's uh, and I spend lots of time in my head where you're not supposed to be uh, not present and aware in this moment at all but composing or editing or, or writing uh, the second book 
and you know completely not here at all. And it, it's, it's supposed to be not what you're supposed to do, but you know who cares? Well, who, that, who said? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you just but you hear a lot, you know. Oh, yeah, know. right. So, but um, and uh, and so I would have thought, oh, you know, some time ago I probably would have thought, oh, I must do that. But now it's like, well, that's just what's what's happening. That's what it was rising now. I don't know everything. There isn't any particular way I'm supposed to be, I guess. And yeah. that's just what's happening now. I mean, you're a bit of a rebel, so uh, screw whatever <laughs> wh whatever anybody says you're supposed to do. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me, I'm a rebel. Yeah. Uh. Um, so, so writing for you has not just been a kind of an instructive thing, like, oh, I have this knowledge to impart to others. It's really been a self-exploration, it sounds like. Well, yeah, I mean, the book, the, the, it's a novella. It's quite short. Mm -hmm. but it started out as a screenplay. It's about that thick. It would have been a four-hour movie. And then I changed it into musical, and I, you know, most because I wanted the exercise of songwriting. This is all during therapy. It was all therapeutic stuff. This is pre-awakening knife episode, or this uh, is it's, it's kind of on on the around that time. It's all okay. on the way to it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, uh, I mean, I had all this material. I, I enjoyed writing the music. I had terrible software. It was very difficult. I could hear everything in my head. I could separate the parts even, but actually getting them down on paper is quite tricky, especially since I know the treble clef. But that was great. And then, you know, the thing happened. Blah, blah, blah. And I had all this material, and I also felt like I needed, in the story of my life, it seemed to be arising, blah, blah, blah. What seemed to be required was some kind of a... a punctuation, you know, period, uh, an, an end, da da. And so I, I changed all this material into a book and I hacked and I chopped and I got rid of so much material and it was great fun and so that's, that was really why that book was written. It, was, it wasn't altruistic really at all, I thought, well, I'm going to help people, you know, I probably won't help people at all. Uh, a couple people, are, uh, lots of people who are addicts, you know, seem to be quite, tell me that they're helped by it. Um, but you know the whole thing. You know, just maybe I, I, I was the first ambition in my sort of conditioned life as a child is being very good at school and being very good at writing and wanting to be a writer. So now I'm I'm just writing. I'm just writing a story now. That I suppose non-dual themes are probably sneaking in there, but it's just you know a tale. And you're referring now to the book you already wrote, um, which oh, no. was called oh your your new book. The, the book that I'm writing now is, is okay. just, yeah, the, the ultimate twist was all that therapy material. And it, it is uh, autobiographical, but um, not completely. Mm -hmm. I had to change a lot of the, um, the situations and issues because uh, I've got children of a sensitive age. Yeah, right. Yeah, so. <laughs> and how about the new book? What's that about? Uh, well, it's about a washed up child star who's going back to Hollywood for a comeback and also about a man who's writing screenplays dropped out of a mundane job and moved to the south in an old, like like Tara, like an old uh, right. plantation to, to do so. And they stumble into one another and they end up in Japan and they end up in with this girl who's sort of a lost soul who's being chased by the people who used to have her captive and blah 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 and it's yeah. just like that. Sounds exciting and, and are you are you trying to weave some kind of uh, non-dual or spiritual theme into it or is it just a story that's kind of cool and interesting to read? Well, I'm kind of trying not to but they, oh, they okay. seem to be s <laughs> sneaking in and you can't uh, help yourself. <laughs> but that uh, um, there's a quote actually I can never remember my brain is not very good really about when you are committed providence moves to I think it's uh, oh, yeah. attributed to Goethe but it was right. paraphrased by somebody else maybe and Nelson Mandela or somebody I don't know I don't think so but I, no, mean, I know what you mean it's like yeah, you, yeah. Just, you just go for it and everything's well, going to sort yeah. of start when, yeah. so when there is doubt when you're wavering then there's this chance to just let it all slip by but when you're committed um, that all kinds of things come to help you that you would never thought possible and it ends up happening because in a way that you never would have dreamed of mm -hmm. because you're committed and that's not necessarily a, a belief system of mine but that is kind of behind the characters motivations in the book mm. and I think that's fascinating the whole thing about I am going to do this blinkers and you know and, and the people do actually get a lot accomplished if that is their you know that's what they want to do when they're like that so and I'm sort of exploring that kind of energy and you haven't you found that yourself I have you, you just yeah you, you commit yourself to something and all sorts of things begin to click 
Uh, indeed, but you know, my conditioning is is also along the lines of, well, you know, I'm not going to completely commit myself, you know, because I'm probably kind of rubbish, and you know, we <laughs> couldn't do it anyway. So, um, so that kind of conditioning comes up. But you know, the voice is in the head, the thoughts that arise, the things that happen. It doesn't necessarily mean um, that I pay much attention to them. Uh, it's you know, I don't know what you, I'd call myself. I mean, just a a lot more content than I used to be, but it, you know, I still get all kinds of, of not so much you are shit kind of messages, but more like, you know, oh, you're not actually very competent in that, are you, kind of things, that <laughs> thoughts that come up, it's probably true, mind you, but, uh, but you know, and, and all, all kinds of ridiculous thoughts come up, my head thinks all kinds of crazy stuff, but you know what, you don't, I don't have to buy into it, I just sort of ignore it, it just kind of plays out, and it rolls away, and that's it. Yeah, it's just that little devil on your left shoulder, you know, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I mean, that illustrates a nice point, an interesting point, which is that, um, and your video is working okay at the moment, by the way, uh, it, which is that... Uh, an awakened person or whatever kind of terminology we want to use uh, doesn't necessarily have qualitatively different kinds of thoughts than an, a non-awakened one. It's just that they're no longer gripped by them to that extent, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I mean, I would put it, I just ignore my myself. <laughs> I just ignore my brain and just get on with whatever I'm doing. You know, I yeah, don't but there was probably a stage in your life where thoughts like that would have been so compelling and convincing and, uh, you know, commanding that, you know, you would have taken them as having a lot more um, gravity than you do now. Oh, so true. Um, I think that, cause I'm sure this comes up for other people as well as me, these sort of thoughts that I'm no good, I am unworthy, the heart of the whole family of, of I am unworthy thoughts. Uh, sorry, my husband's yelling downstairs because I guess England must have just scored a try against Wales in the rugby. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, oh, gosh, I kind of lost that train of thought as well now. Uh, we're talking about thoughts of unworthiness. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, now, this might be a, a, a trait of an addictive personality, but I had this sort of great grandiosity and very low self-esteem at the same time. And all those thoughts along the lines of, I am unworthy, uh, I, I'm terrible, I don't deserve to live, I have no right to be here, those kind of thoughts were sort of generally stuffed down and repressed by the grandiose part of me that thought it was fantastic, wonderful, and amazing. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, when, when I was going through therapy, and, and you know, people go through therapy in all kinds of ways, often through just talking with their friends. and. Uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was I had to, un to unleash all that. So for a while, when I was actually getting healthier, I was just I was just I'm thinking I'm terrible. How could I have done this? Blah 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 blah. I'm horrible. One really, and I don't want to. You know, I don't deserve to exist. I am a bad person. Uh, but I mean, I sort of had to let the lid off that Pandora's box, and they all sort of flew away and stopped being having any power whatsoever. But you know, this isn't really you know non-duality. It's just what seemed to happen to me, and it seems to happen to a lot of people in various kind of practices that have to do with um, stripping away layers of the ego, whatever it is, whether it's Zen Buddhism or whether it's intensive psychotherapy. Yeah. Well, uh, stripping away um, layers of the ego is an important little phrase there to add on to what you just said because, I mean, it seems to me that if one is sort of solidly, concretely, predominantly convinced in one's experience that I am this person and that's all I am, then the, the kind of thoughts you were just talking about would have a lot of significance. You know, oh, I, I, all I am is this person and I'm a terrible one, I, my life should end, and you know, blah, blah, blah. But if, you know, if one kind of become, comes to appreciate that, whoa, I'm much more than this small little tiny dot on the planet that there's a much vaster reality then how much gravity how much you know impact can such thoughts have it's almost like they're just kind of a, <clears throat> a static left over from from something that you know, I don't know not bad analogy there but they're, they're just kind of superficial noise uh, that still maybe habitually rides a bit on on the on a much vaster uh, more significant 
uh, level of experience. Yeah, um, microcosm, macrocosm, I suppose. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I suppose the whatever the thought is, even if it is, I rock. I am so great. I mean, I don't really grip onto that either. I do occasionally have that kind of thought as well. Uh, probably more often than than I used to, but you know, it, none of it matters. None of it matters. And uh, I don't know. Um, what I am, and what you are, and the big I, and the little I, and the big the, the uh, self spelled big S, and self spelled the little S, and I, I you know, uh, some people are very comfortable with those kind of pointers, and I just don't know. I, I mean, I I tend to think of. I'm more comfortable with the, uh, the pointer, or I resonate more with the idea of this one endless moment. This is it. This is all there ever is. Whatever it looks like, even if it seems a very small thing, or if it seems a really big thing, that's the same thing. Um, if you seem like you're contracted in a small self with a little s and this tiny i, or you feel like you're everything and you have no edges on your body and you're like out of your body and you're like so blissful and you are everything. Um, if that's, then that's, that's what it is. It, it is, and the, but it's the same thing. It is exactly the same thing. It just has a different face. That's exactly what I was going to say when I heard you saying that, that it's the same thing. Um, and, you know, it's like when you think about when you're, anyway, when I was in high school, I was so concerned about how I looked, how, how, how long oh, my hair. Oh, I still am. Uh, how long my hair was, you know, what other people thought of me, whether I was cool, this and that, you know, whether I was muscular or, you know. And, you know, these days it's like I can barely remember my age or, or you know, <laughs> have any sense of that, that kind of stuff. It's, uh, maybe it's just a matter of maturation, but... Um, it's, Maybe it's a matter of gender. I don't know. Yeah, I still, that, still yeah. wonder about my looks, and you know. But no, it's no. That's another thing that doesn't grip me. I enjoy making myself up. I putting things out of my eyes so you don't see the bags and the wrinkles so much, and this kind of thing. But I don't really care. You know. Yeah, it could be a gender thing. I mean, Byron Katie and Gangaji both had plastic surgery. So what the hell? Did they really? Oh yeah. well. No, I haven't had any of that yet. I had the veins done on my left leg, mm -hmm. uh, but it's mostly because they were very uncomfortable. Mm. And uh, but that's so you could I don't know I don't think that's plastic surgery you could put me on that list if the veins <laughs> count. Okay, <laughs> well, join the club. Yeah. So when after you had your awakening moment, um, did you feel like therapy had become superfluous, uh, or did you actually continue on with it for some time? Yeah, I think you just had to. Um, I think the therapist and I needed to like have. A sort of a formula by which we came to a conclusion, and it was a, a bit after that, definitely. Um, and, but uh, we still text very occasionally. Okay. And as I recall, your therapist had a sort of an appreciation of non-dual teachings or something. Yeah, well, just the therapist in the book isn't exactly like my therapist, and the relationship that the characters in my book had, the therapist and Lucy, is not much juicier than more interesting than the very slow kind of, you know, thing that, that went on in my therapy. Because it's, you know, my book's tiny and short, and the therapy went on for ages, you know, I don't know, 18 months, once or twice a week. Well, that's not so, so long compared to some Well, people. some people, I know, but this was intense, you know, it was yeah. really intense. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like, uh, let's have a chat. And it was all very, very, you know, emotional, and each and every single time. Uh, so, no, it, it went on for, for a little while. Um, but because I think that that kind of therapy is going through just has a natural conclusion, and it, that does take a certain amount of time. I wonder if your therapy was somehow instrumental in bringing about the awakening you had, because um, you weren't really just, doing spiritual practices. But no, that's, that's the main thing you were doing. Was that? That's it. Well, I mean, it is. It, it was. A, I turn my video on. It was a spiritual practice. Uh, yeah, it yeah. Turned out that it was. It, it was. Many of the same things, just with different techniques that people who are engaged in a very traditional, you know, meditative, um, guru-bound uh, um, teaching kind of relationship. It's the same, the same sort of thing. It's the same sort of practices, um, but and often people get the same sort of practices in the kind of job that they have, or the the discussions that they have with their friends, or the relationship they have with their parents, or, or that kind of thing. Um, it just, you know, it, it, 
practice unfolds in, in many, many different ways. I don't know if it was instrumental. It's just how it seemed to happen in, in the story of my life. Conducive to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that kind of reminds me of something you said earlier, which is that everything kind of seems to be orchestrated in our best interests, ultimately, even though it might seem... Um, undesirable at the time it's uh, from the big picture looking back if you will um, you, you realize oh that was perfect yeah, I, I really needed that to go through that uh, that's how it seems to me I mean I know there are people who have deeply unfulfilling lives from the day they're born to the day they die and don't you know or spend their entire time as a subsistence farmer in Africa shuffling you know miles every day just to get some water and but you know that kind of a life could be okay as long as you actually have your needs taken care of that, that there's nothing wrong with that life and, and practice can be the walk um, but I know there are some some people who you know do not have the whole microcosm and macrocosm of, of their life and, and many people have more of a job like ex, you know existence and many people are are victims for their the entire course of their lives so as perhaps it, it, I, I don't like that. I wish that you know, if I could change things, I would change that. But it's it's like in the big bigger picture of of all lives, you know, um, uh, that's where balance happens. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it kind of comes down to whether we understand or appreciate or believe that you know there is some divine intelligence that's orchestrating everything, and whether that divine intelligence, el intelligence ultimately has the best interests of everything in mind and is kind of shepherding everything along toward higher and higher evolution and you know things like that which we s it's somewhat theoretical to discuss although some say that that's really their their experience of life they can see those mechanics happening um, but it it certainly helps you to kind of come to terms with the, the, the people in Africa or whoever you know that are going through such miserable lives that you can sort of see some ultimate cosmic uh, justification for it. Yeah, I don't know if I do. I don't, it probably doesn't actually resonate with me very much, divine, intelligent, orchestrating everybody to higher consciousness. <laughs> I mean, I think that this is the higher consciousness. This is it. This is high, high as it gets. You know, it might seem to get higher, and then that will be as high as it gets, but I don't, that doesn't sort of come into uh, the concepts that resonate with me but you know a, a, a life seems to be quite ordered you know this planet with life on it I mean there are certain rules of physics and biology that seem to happen it seems quite ordered uh, so there's certainly you know that I would buy into yeah there's some organizing intelligence apparently um, organ that's what I mean when I say orchestrating I don't I don't sort of mean like a puppeteer who is yeah yeah, in, yeah. In, 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 but uh, you know, you look at anything in, in, on the Discovery Channel, whatever, some little story about what goes on inside a cell, and you, it, it's jaw-dropping when you It is. Of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, and also, when you say this is as high as it gets, um, you know, do you go to, a, let's say, a person who's psychotic in a mental hospital and say, you know, this is as high as it gets, <laughs> which, which is sort of synonymous with this is as good as it gets, um, which reminds me of an old beer ad, but I won't go there. But... Um, <laughs> You know, or or is it is there a possibility that that particular confused soul uh, has some kind of brighter future? You know, as they move along and straighten out, and you know, whatever, either this lifetime or future lifetimes. I mean, I don't want to get too esoteric about it, but mm. that that could very well be the mechanics of the way the universe works. Well, it's just our mind wanting it to make sense. You know, it doesn't it make is. sense. It isn't. Uh, you know, there's there's karma. There's there's rebirth, you know, to, to take care of those people who have the crap life their whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, but that's just because the mind wants it all to make sense somehow. And uh, I don't but know that... It could actually be the way it works, though. I mean, sure, maybe... sure. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly care. But, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah it, it certainly could. It certainly could. Um, 
you know, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go to a men- mental hospital and say to a psychotic person, "This is good to get some." Not that that mean. <laughs> it makes me laugh. They're like, yeah, "It's as good as it gets." Forget about it. Uh, no, I mean, but you know, you know how that unfolds. There's drugs. There's this. And people try. Some people never get better, and they can just sort of be looked after. And then that's that's where the karma comes in. Hopefully, yeah. in the next life. And blah. But but. Um, but you know, just in the the one endless moment that's always now, in which there appear to be psychotic people from time to time, uh, I suppose a different way that you, the mind can try to make sense of it is that they have a role to play. If there wasn't a psychotic person over here, you wouldn't understand that there's a sane person over here. So, yeah, uh, I mean, people sometimes in the the whole story of life have very difficult roles to play, and I just heard. Um, Oh, well, about six months ago, somebody I, I didn't know personally, but knew of, died uh, alone in their flat, in their vomit, in the feces, and in a heroin overdose. And mm. quite, you know, quite surprisingly, this person had never been into that particular drug before. Mm. And uh, also, nobody really knew that they'd been dead for some days because nobody, um, uh, they, he, they, they, he had alienated everybody. And nobody, you know, cared what happened to him anymore. And uh, so that, whoa, that is a difficult role to play. I mean, all the people that found out about that were, you know, learning lessons and having, you know, really saying, oh, you know, maybe that, that could be me, that could be me, you know. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and they just have some people have a very difficult role to play, but, you know, every role can potentially change. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, this is sort of a, a whole different train of thought than than non-duality, I suppose. It, um, uh, as one small self and one contained ego and one personality, you can only do so much to, to help others. Um, and I tend to try to do what I can with the handy and convenient people I actually live with, mm-hmm. you know. And they actually need lots of, of tending to and take up a lot of my time and energy. So, Think globally, act locally. As yeah. Say. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, there's some good points you brought out there. I mean, one is if we're going to have a universe, it seems that we need to have duality in it or, you know, pairs of opposites. If we're going to have, you know, psychologically healthy people, we've got to have psychotics. If we're going to have hot, we're gonna ha- we have to have cold. And, you know, if we're going to have fast, we have to have slow. It, it, otherwise... Everything would be one amorphous blob with no distinctions within it. <laughs> <laughs> Life seems like that sometimes. Yeah. An amorphous blob with no distinctions. But, yeah, yeah, no, that, I mean, I, I say this a lot, and the few talks I've given, this always comes up. I said that there's nothing wrong with duality. I mean, you wouldn't know good if there wasn't evil to compare it to. Now, it's really unfortunate, but that is the case. And now, someday it might be just the memory of evil. We can work for that. That's fine. But you know, the the this is duality. I mean, this this is one. But in in order for there to be this uh, cup, this object that I'm picking up, there has to be, you know, the atoms have to be arranged a certain way, and there has to be a subject, an object, mm-hmm. just to sort of get through life, regardless of what the actual reality is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a Sanskrit phrase, um, lesha vidya, which means faint remains of ignorance. And the um, implication is that no matter how quote unquote enlightened one becomes, there has to be a, a sort of a some faint remains of you know con- concession with the, du- the dualistic world in order to actually function as a human being. Um, otherwise, y- you know, you lie down and die. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't take care of yourself, wouldn't you? You, yeah. <laughs> you get uh, taken out with the garbage one morning, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that thing you said about roles is kind of interesting, too. It, it kind of implies that we almost sign up for roles, and some people say it that way, that we, before coming into this life, we choose to, you know, take on a certain uh, destiny in order to teach lessons to ourselves or to others and so on. Who knows? I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to speculate. Um, go ahead. You were going to say something. Uh, no, I don't think it was. Um, but yeah, I think that. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand um, why the the concept of reincarnation 
is believed by so many many people and I'm saying that that I don't actually it I mean it if you're trying the mind is trying to make sense of things and uh, signing up for a role beforehand it's like okay I'm going to be a martyr this time I'm going to, to be have a terrible life uh, because somebody has to and because I'm filling this bit of the energy with the terrible life somebody over here is going to have the good life so and but and I like that idea Maybe that is the way it works, but you know, uh, maybe not. I don't know, uh, but I, I like the idea. I can understand why it, it's an appealing concept. It really uh, it does seem to explain a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's some people who say, well, in fact, Tony Parsons says there is no reincarnation because that implies that there would be someone to reincarnate, and there is no one. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the absolute view, you know, on a, on a relative level, as we were just discussing, um, there is someone even though ultimately if you boil that down to its essence it's it's nothing it's the it's the vacuum state or whatever but you know, you know so reincarnation it may both at, it be it may exist and at the same time it's an illusion uh, yeah. and both can be true simultaneously oh yeah I, and I that, I truly think that that's that that resonates with me anyway mm -hmm. um, I'm right with with Tony Parsons it's, I mean there uh, I really did the, the whole that everything is a complete illusion and that nothing is happening really. Um, I sort of I get that or you know I I see that or I don't know whatever the right way to put that is. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter whether there's reincarnation or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter whether there's heaven or hell. Um, everything is this. This is everything. And it you know there isn't as something in the future in the, the next life. You know, the future is speculation. Reincarnation is speculation. Uh, the past is memory, always. And the, the speculation is, is also a thought process. And all those thought processes always are happening here, now. And that's all there is. So, I mean, that, 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 that is, you know, I suppose that is, uh, I don't want to say anything that Tony Parsons says or that that's what he says, but I believe that is. The, the gist of what he says, and, and that deeply resonates. Mm -hmm. I mean, the story can be as interesting as you like. I mean, you can have angels talking to you. You can, <laughs> you know, oh my God! I mean, you can have states of bliss. You can float and levitate. You can, you can, uh, you know, you could, you know, on a more mundane level, you could up sticks and move to Australia. You know, you, the story can be as interesting as you like. Um, but you know, it's all the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And again, physics would tell us that, that you know, it's all the same sort of primordial, unmanifest state, just kind of giving rise to you know, virtual appearances, um, but it's all ultimately the same stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Huh. Well, Rick, um, I've got a deadline coming up, actually. Okay, well, this is yeah. a good stopping point. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we, we stopped okay, we bye. your <laughs> videos about 20 times. But <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, um, so thanks. This has been fun. I've, I've enjoyed, you know, talking to you, and I think people enjoy hearing this. Um, you may want to make any concluding remarks, or is that good what you just said? Oh, I think that. Um, oh, what I always say is that this is not necessarily to do with non-duality, but I think that many people, many little self small s's, their tiny eyes, whatever, mm -hmm. are very hard on themselves, and all the those thoughts of unworthiness we were talking about later that's come up a lot and people buy into them a lot mm -hmm. and it upsets me and uh, <laughs> I just want to say to everybody you're perfect exactly as you are and it doesn't matter what the story of your life is it's perfect you are perfect as you are it doesn't matter what the outcome the, the things of your life and in this moment right now everybody is just exactly as they are they're perfect gorgeous, unbelievable, miraculous, apparent creations, everybody. And uh, I would just love to see people being a little less hard on themselves. Beautiful. So, in other words, lighten up. Lighten up. Chill out. <laughs> Great. So, uh, let me conclude. I've been talking with Suzanne Foxton, who lives in the UK. Uh, Suzanne has a blog, which I'll be linking to from my blog, which is Buddha at the Gas Pump or BatGap.com. Um, and she also has some videos on YouTube, which you can watch. Uh, if you search for Suzanne Fox, and I'm sure you'll see them. Um, she's written a book, and I think is working on a second book. So I'll be linking to that, and you can send me, a, you know, the info, info on your new book when it comes out, and link to that as well. 
Um, if you would like to be notified of few, uh, fur future um, interviews that I do, and I do one a week, then you can either subscribe on YouTube or you can go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and sign up for an email newsletter there. You'll receive an email once a week or so when a new interview is posted. There's also a um, podcast you can sign up for if you want to listen to this on your iPod while you ride your horse or whatever you do. <laughs> so thanks, Suzanne. Uh, it's been nice talking thanks. to you. Thanks, and, Rick. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, take care. You too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.